Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Jeez, it's a healthy crowd today. That's nice. Hi, oh, Sharon's there. Yeah, look, pe people I haven't seen. Ah, oh, Breck. Ah, oh, Jen. Good to see you all. Um, I love the book of Luke, and I've recently realised, um, not that I haven't before, but it's just come rung true to me that the Gospel of Luke um, is really enriched with Jesus's relationship with people that live around him. So there's a lot of stories of him hanging out, having meals with folks, um, talking to people in the street, and um, it, it's really earthy. And there's a lot of chicks in it. Yeah. yeah. So you might find that for every every um, male that's a story, there is another, a woman. And, and even the opening of uh, the Gospel of Luke, um, you've got Elizabeth, you've got Mary and you've got Anna, all important people announcing the Gospel story that is about to occur and the person of God that is about to walk the earth. Um, and that is a... It's, a, it's, it's empowering, it's encouraging, and it reminds us that even the smallest people God cares for. And it also tells us something about the nature of what it meant to be God on earth. And I think this reading does that too. It comes from chapter 4, 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when, when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live on bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him an, an, in an instant all kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority for it has been given for it has been given over to me and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me it will all be yours. Jesus answered him it is written worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is said, I do not put the Lord your God, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him and, uh, until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Gemma. Do you get the odd feeling that you just like to preach about now? Yeah. yeah. I, I, could, I could feel it. And I'm sitting at the back thinking, this is the day, if I'd just been more prophetically in tune, I would have said, we should do this as a team, as a team ministry sport pretty much we should well you get a chance it is it's a great reading and what i love uh, hearing it proclaimed here today is to know that our catholic friends and our anglican friends uniting friends um, lutheran friends all around the world this is one of the key readings in, in the first sunday of the lenten period and to think of the all of us no matter what our backgrounds are and our histories having to hear and drink in the word of god uh, globally in every language in almost every culture around the planet wherever people meet faithfully that's going to be proclaimed in so many churches today and i think there's something very powerful about the nature of the body of christ alive and well in the world and if you're not doing it already think about your brothers and sisters in ukraine think about your brothers and sisters in afghanistan because there are some there think about your brothers and sisters in indigenous cultures you know it's a huge world your brothers and sisters in flooded queensland in flooded new south wales you know it's not just about us is it it's a huge thing and then the way that your brothers and sisters are ming mingling and meeting and encouraging and praying and being immersed in the cultures all around them too it's huge i've got into the habit when we we're kind of meeting in smaller groups during these COVID safe times of asking what did you notice in the reading was there something that stood out to you and Gemma, you've got a chance to to bust out something that might have occurred to you too and even you know creep up here i'm happy to share the microphone um was there anything else that stood out to you in the reading today something that might have grabbed your attention you might have heard for the first time or just hit you sort of between the ears 
in a new way. Anything that you heard? Graham, I see that hand. Forty days. You think if you're son of God, you're pretty much ready to go? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a really good point. We'll get we'll get into that forty days. That's a really good observation. And like I notice every week, with almost every question or insight that's brought, there's like another sermon topic we could unfold. That's great, Graham. Anybody else with something that just grabbed their attention in that this morning? Yeah, Lynn. It it is written. It is written. So it tells us something about um, the way that Jesus has been formed over a period of time to know what the word actually holds. And not just, you know, you've probably all met people who are just picky with the word of God. You know, you say something that it's like playing cards. I'm going to just slap you down with, you know, card number Deuteronomy 15. 19 whatever it is that's not what jesus is doing it is a slap down to satan but this is about the character of jesus that's hearing what's being asked and has something in store not just a little line from scripture but the full feeling and the full weight of what his life actually means and that's going to tie us back into graham as well Gemma, i knew you'd be keen i know Yep. Different scrolls. So you know sometimes when you spend a bit of time by yourself and someone that prays and reads, and then the stuff that comes up, those readings really trigger. Yep. We're all tempted. We are. And if we're living in the word or we take something away from us in a service, it often comes up during the week yep. and presents itself and it gives us um, strength to go in a different direction that is more godly than whether we were embedded and enmeshed in that. Absolutely. Absol- <laughs> Seriously, you should climb up here. <laughs> so these are really important points, and Tim, I'll get to you in just a second, because there is something, and it's back to your point, Graham. what is this around? There's something about, and Lynn too, something about the nurture of Jesus around the word of God, which is the nourishment for his life. And so in that time when he's in the wilderness, there's something about that nourishment that is now really needed, because he is hungry. It says in that reading he was famished at the end of that. Well, who wouldn't be? You know, to be honest... Um, uh, and here's my confession for today. It doesn't take me long to get famished at all. I'm th- I'm, I start the day thinking, oh, well, there's a block of chocolate in the cupboard. Maybe I'll just leave it there. And then it's like, I think I need it now. And, and sometimes it's been worse, you know, worse things. And I think, maybe I need that about now. So there's lots of ways of being famished. There's lots of ways of feeling like I don't have enough to get me through today maybe i need that cake maybe i need that wine maybe i need whatever else it might be that extra song the extra five hours on facebook whatever i mean we can find a lot of ways that become the um kind of the surrogate ways of being nurtured for our spirit to kind of be fed because we're often alone we often feel kind of empty on the inside maybe we're not really loved or honored enough so we'll try and find the other things but jesus is going right to i'm being nourished by my father i'm really nourished by my father and it's really clear in this 40 days as things are being stretched right out how deep that nourishment is going so i want to hold those things there there's something about nourishment the 40 days is important and we're going to get to tim and then you john tim Yet the theme of 40? Is right the it is. And it usually references exactly what you just said. Yep. Absolutely. Now, hold that thought. That's a good one, too. The 40s are significant. John, before I go off on another tangent. I'm on the same page. On the same page as Tim. Good. <laughs> and that's where it's good to <laughs> and that's where it's good to say that yeah, 40 days can be like 40 actual days could be 40 years people of israel and, and, and Moses, sorry, spent 40, years. 40 40 years and as you said sometimes it's not about the dates and it's not about the years it's actually can feel like this is what life has felt like for a long long time and so the biblical 40 years then becomes a nourishing point for people who feel like they're i'm not sure where i've landed yet 
There's something very powerful about that 40 years. How many people think, like, when Israel has left Egypt and they're heading across through the wilderness and it should have only taken them, like, a weekend to get to where they were going, but, of course, anybody tried to lead toddlers? I mean, it's... Um, you know, <laughs> what should take two minutes to get out of the door sometimes takes, like, several hours. They've lost their shoes, they've lost their jumper. I thought you were wearing a jacket. Where's the jacket now? Oh, it's under your bed. How'd it get there? Oh, it's in the dog's kennel. You know, lots of things... And so they're off on this journey and, and when they get to the promised land and they're told the story, oh, there's giants over there and some of them want to go and others, oh, no, no, I don't want to, I can't, I'm not ready to face giants. And then it's the longer journey, that 40 years um, and it is a cleansing time, it's a nourishing time. How many people think that 40 years is like a punishment? Oh, good. I'm not seeing any hands. I've met people... <laughs> Oh, thank you, Angela. Thank you. Oh, you've just saved my sermon point this morning. I knew there'd be some kind soul out there. So I've met people who think of it as a punishment, that somehow they weren't quite good enough. Somehow they did the wrong thing. They got to the crossing of the Jordan to get into the Promised Land and they weren't up to scratch and it's off you go. I'm going to punish you now. You can all die out and bring back a new generation and have another go. It sounds like that for some folks. But actually, it's something about the nourishment. How I picture it, and I think it's been helped because um, I've got little grandchildren. One's 10, one's 6. They seem to be like going on 35. I don't know how that happens. They seem very grown up. And I've got a little grandson who's just around six months. And um, our son and, son and his partner sent us uh, some lovely images of Billy starting to, you know, drag himself across the floor in search of little toys and his little... Pet I was going to say a pet tiger, his toy tiger. <laughs> I don't want to go down that tiger path. And, um, and it's just wonderful seeing him. And in the background, you hear nothing but encouragement. You know, the encouragement for Billy to have a bit of a go at it. And I was watching the video thinking, oh, gee, that runs out fast, doesn't it? You know, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm still crawling across the floor, reaching for a few goals that are still a little way in front of me. You know that feeling? Um, but as you get older... The, the cheering, laughing, you are amazing team seem to disappear out the back door. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Like you've struggled really hard and you think, I've had a major win today. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You're the only one who noticed. You know, that there's something about growing up. So here is Israel. They've been slaves for so long. They do come across this unknown space. They're learning to rely on the hand of God for feeding and for water. They get to the promised land. They've been through a lot already, but they're not quite ready. And I think it's kind of the way I've began to hear this now, it's more like God saying, you know, I brought you here because I thought you'd be fine. I thought you'd be good to go. I thought you'd be ready to go, but you're not. So let's spend some more time going back to some foundations and some fundamentals and some working through what it means to be my people because you're not quite ready yet to be my people. So sometimes it can be seen as punishment, but I actually think this is the way the Lord works with us. There are times in our lives that are the, the revelation times for the what else might be needed and it can feel like a setback. And this is where I think Satan's voice, that tempting voice comes. Oh, look, you know, you're 60 years old. What a hopeless wreck you are. You think you could do this by now? You know, you call yourself a Christian, you go to that church, shouldn't you be better? Shouldn't you be better? It's easy to hear that kind of language seeping through, whereas I think God is saying, yeah, look, I thought you'd be good to go, but there's still other things you need to be formed in. In your 40 days, there's something about being nourished in the word of God to actually be encouraged again so that you can face what you're currently facing. You know, that trip to the doctors, that surgery, the difficult thing in the family, the hard life that your grandchild's going through and you need to get alongside them, an ageing parent, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to be with you in that. Does that make sense to you? So the 40 days, the 40 years is important and Graham, it's right back to your initial observation. For Jesus, he is a son of God and there could almost be a sense of everything is easy, but it's not. Because Jesus is a model also for us. You know, in the, the, the original garden, whoever you might want to picture the Garden of Eden, there's a huge challenge there about how humanity in its, in its naivety, in its childhood, will handle truth. And a voice comes, a conniving voice that just says, you know, did he, did he really say that? 
did God really, I don't think he said you would die. No, it's easy to be confused and however you might think about Adam and Eve, there's a failure, there's a loss, there's a fall, there's a sense of confusion that comes into their hearts and it's almost like everything else. It used to be unified and together and then suddenly, you know, however you, again, however you might think about this, um, Adam no longer trusts Eve and he can't wait to blame her for what's what he thinks is going to be punished for and he can't even speak to God straight. Suddenly, out of perfection, you have lies and conniving and cheating and all the things that we get used to in our world. So in this reading today, we have Jesus as the new Adam and he's come out of the waters of baptism and this is his statement of, this is who I am, I am yours and I'm here with all of these people. It's a statement of integrity and identity and he makes a journey he comes out of that water and immediately he's drawn by the spirit into the wilderness and the wilderness takes everything else away there's no more beautiful mary patting him on the head and saying you're amazing how great it is to have you as my son of 30 years Uh, there's none of his mates around him he's totally on his own and in that aloneness then the tempter starts to come with all of those words no, gee, how easy it would be. Now, if you are the son of God, you could, how easy, you could just turn these, these rocks into bread. You know, no, no, no. I know the word of God. It doesn't say that. That's not going to be the thing. No, I've got to, got to live on the word of God. That's going to be my nourishment. That's who I am. Then Satan amps it up. Well, you know, people are going to follow you. Um, and they're going to love you, but all you have to do is just bow down to me first and it's going to be okay. Just just cave in just a little bit. Or why don't you be like a superman? You know, dive off the highest part of the temple and float yourself down, you know, like Clark Kent with his flying cloak, uh, cloak. And everyone will look at you and think, how amazing. We've never seen anybody like that before. But at every single point, Jesus is identifying himself as the one who is the shepherd of the sheep. How will the sheep want to hear my voice if I'm the superman who flies over everything else and I'm the man of steel that nothing ever touches? How will that relate to the person in hospital or the person going through cancer therapy, to the person who's really afraid for their niece or their nephew or their son and their daughter, for the person who's had their heart sort of broken because their lifelong partner is gone and they've got... Jesus cannot be the shepherd for all that variety of people if he takes on board the temptations to be the super person. And if he bows down to Satan, well, what then? How many other things will Satan demand? You know, and probably a lot of us in the room might have had that same kind of thing, you know, um, and I'm not asking for a show of hands or anything, but some of you I know have probably been married to the partner who looked like they were sweetness and light or amazing, but they turned out being the partner from hell. They told you that they were be there through sickness and through health, but when sickness came, you couldn't see them for dust. They told you they would be there for rich or for poor, but when you know, there was a bit of a tight time and the budget was scarce, they couldn't wait to get on a plane and find a better life somewhere else with somebody else who was more cashed up. You now, there's a lot of reasons why people bail, so it's important to know that you know, some of us have had the experience of putting ourselves under an authority sometimes it's been a partner sometimes it's been a boss sometimes it's been a framework of work because i've just needed money i want to build a house i want to raise a family yes what can i do now i'll do more and some of you will know that terrible sinking feeling of i work 30 hours a week no it's not 40 hours a week no it's not it's 50 it's 60 it's 70 and it's climbing because I don't dare say no because as soon as I say no, what will the authority above me say? We can find somebody else who'll do it. Thank you. Clear your desk in 15 minutes and security will work, walk you out. So what Jesus is doing in the wilderness is confronting a voice that wants to be the master of his life that isn't God but pretends in every way to be. And Jesus says, no, we're not having any of that either and a lot of us might identify with that because some of us have known what it's like to be under someone who we thought they'd give us security they thought they'd give us love we thought they'd give us a, a, a good career but in the end it broke our bones 
and we found ourselves living a bit like ancient Egypt in like ancient Israel in Egypt um, more bricks less less straw harder harder work for minimal returns until it gets to the point of you just want to resign and get out of there so the more time we spend in that 40 days thinking about Jesus nourished on the word Jesus making a journey of faith to really declare who he is and to face realistic temptations because life is flipping hard and it was really hard for Jesus too and there was more things coming his way and if you can't win the little battles how will you win the big ones and my own life has enough of those I've had to have those times maybe you have too the times of repentance and confession and it's really hard getting to the area of truth it's hard enough on your own let alone in the company of others who love you it's a really tough journey but Jesus sets the course for that not of judgment and of punishment but of so much love that you can stand even when you feel like all your authority has been undermined and taken away so this reading is powerful it reminds us of the 40-day journey it reminds us of what it is to be clarified what it is to be clear what it is to be nurtured what it is to be uplifted by the powerful word of God not the word just on a page but the word that is the Holy Spirit living word inside you that helps you when you don't know where your life is anymore you probably don't may not even realize it but a lot of us have been on a, a very long um, time in the wilderness over the COVID lockdowns when you couldn't go where you wanted to go and you couldn't be with where you wanted, where, who you wanted to be with, you couldn't do the things you really wanted to do and you couldn't be often the kind of person you really wanted to be because all those other little props and things were taken away. What did we find in that time? Some of us found where our good angels were. We found maybe our better selves maybe we had a chance to stop and to think and to renew and to come back to foundations some of us found it wasn't really quite like that we became angry we became frustrated we became tearful we became fearful we became t churned up by many many different things and there was no peace during that there was nothing but agitated confrontation so when you think about even the lockdowns and walk your way back to Jesus in the wilderness we discover the connection point between Jesus and Saviour and us today with the wilderness as we find ourselves in. Because the tempter's voice will still come and say, look, why don't you do something easy? Just take the, take the easy way. Why make it so hard? Give in, give up. Or why don't you just bow down to me? Bow down to another authority. Paul, I'll get to you, yeah. Bow down to another authority. Or why don't you just you know behave like somehow life doesn't really touch you because you want to be somehow famous and noteworthy on Facebook or social media whatever else it might be so there are big themes Paul yeah couple of words Absolutely. And that's why we have you know, so many charlatans out there now. Absolutely. But the other thing is, too, with Jesus Christ, if he had been tempted, this is the big message that I take from that talk, if he had allowed himself to be tempted, he would have sinned. And if he sinned, we would not... No, it'd be different. To, to it'd be a different God. journey. Your redemption would never have happened. It'd it would all be lost. It is. And that's where, if we had, like... The other Paul, the ancient Paul, the Apostle Paul in the room, he'd say, thank you, Paul. Because that's what I'm trying to say about the new Adam. That where our fails and our difficulties were, Jesus actually exemplifies that, you, that he met um, maybe different versions of, but the same integral challenges that we actually have. The same issues over what does it really mean to live with integrity in a world that's difficult, where there's an easier way all the time. And Jesus is the model of the new Adam. And in the new Adam, there is a new creation. In the new creation, there is a new way of being community. And being community is risky and it's hard. And we, we all get that conniving word, oh, you know, your church is hopeless. Look at that minister. Pff, my goodness. I'm sure there's somebody better out there somewhere. Whatever it is, the whispering voices that come that say it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, cut, cut, cut. And then in our media, I mean, um, 
and I don't want to get wildly political, but I, I listen, I read a whole bunch of different newspapers and watch a, little, a lot of different casts and I think we've got the voices of that satanic voice that's also manifest in people. So as soon as you hear somebody say, I'm telling you the truth, and then you listen to what they're saying, you think, oh, I, I don't think so. I, that's not what I'm seeing with my eyes and with my ears and feeling with my heart. But people try it, and we've got that with Ukraine and Russia, Putin rather than Russia, actually. I think a lot of Russian people are over. It's about everything. But Putin's certainly saying, I want to tell you a version of the truth so that you will know why we've had to do it for humanitarian reasons to take over another country. But, you know, trust me, because they're nothing but Nazis and, you know, and the rest of it. You know, it's, so even in our, in our world, the humanity world, the twisting of truth is really, really easy, and we've learned it from the master from way back. And just in case you're not aware of it, and I've probably repeated this a bit, Satan is really boring. The same voice in Eden, whoever you want to think about that, is the same voice that comes to Jesus. It's the same voice that came to Israel. The Assyrian commander is a great example of that. And the same voice that comes to us. It's always dressed up. It'll, it's almost like getting this, the same junk mail in your letterbox week after week after week. But it comes with different colours and different fonts and different headings. But it essentially just says the same thing. You are hopeless and you are nothing without me. And it's the sooner that you realise that you're a snivelling wreck or, alternatively, if that doesn't work, that you are just amazing. And uh, why aren't people following you and loving you as much as they should? How terrible that must be. So Satan is boring. That's the number one thing to know. And a lot of us listen to boring voices and we've heard them almost all of our lives. John, last one. Last one for... Sorry. No, that's, don't be Sorry. Yeah, it's another part of the another part of scripture, but the intention is is right. It's yeah, get it get out of the way. It's a different context, John, but the the sentiment is right. Um, the other thing that that reading says at the end is that so Satan withdrew, waiting for a more opportune time. Uh, in um, Mel Gibson's The Passion, which I'm not highly recommending because of the violence within it, but Satan circles all through that movie, right up to the cross. Uh, always waiting for the opportune time when you know that, that pain, confusion and difficulty will dismantle a person like that. And, uh, and Satan was waiting for Jesus to be dismantled. Like a roaring lion. Like, yeah, like a roaring lion. Waiting to devour you. Waiting to devour you. But Jesus wouldn't be. And so for each of us who feel our weaknesses, and Satan will remind us all of how weak we are, how fallen we are, how much shame we should have. It's really important to gather with someone you trust to pray for you, to come against those kinds of words because you're not. The Lord God loves you and the world. That's why God sent his son. And not to fill us up with endless judgment and guilt because that is really easy. You can take a very faithful person and put them on the sidelines forever because they never feel good enough for anything. Because if God really knew, he would hate me. Now, God doesn't hate you. He loves you. And he does know that you have weaknesses. And he does know that you're not God. And he does know you have bad days. And he does know you, you get things wrong and you say the wrong words. And you wish you could you know, take them all back. But the Lord loves you. And in this season, as we prepare, as we prepare our way through Lent towards... Easter Sunday, it's really good to remind ourselves of all these important things. And that is why I think it's good that so many churches start this journey with a sense of temptation. Because goodness me, what a tempted world it still is. And grace is still amazing. Still amazing. So look, we're going to make a journey into communion soon. But just before we do, just a couple of things to let you know what's around us today. Um, in the middle, there's um, what I'm taking to be an image of the tree of life. 
And what I've done on that is to shade the main part of the tree in green and I'd encourage you either during communion or after the service um, just to go over that green with one of the other pens that's there. I want, it, I want that green section to be as solid and as vibrant as possible um, but just the green section, don't shade in anywhere else, just that. So that's going to be Tree of Life reminding us of Tree of Life in Eden, reminding us of the Tree of Life that's in the book of Revelation, reminding us of the fruitfulness that is actually still there every day for each of us who dare to stand by the, by the river, the river of the Holy Spirit, the river of the Lord, flowing from the temple right into the world today. And whether you feel it or not, that's actually where we plant it. So feel free to just shade in that green, make it nice and bold. The other thing too, um, and we're not a huge liturgical church, last Wednesday was what? Ash Wednesday. And some of you might have gone to Catholic Church or Anglicans or somewhere, or might have even just at home thought, I really just want this sense of a deeper connection with the wider church with Ash Wednesday. Some of you may not realise that Ash Wednesday actually uses the palm leaves from the previous year from the hallelujahs in the street, Palm Sunday, keeps them, dries them. This is actually from Palm Sunday back, oh, pre-COVID days, 2018. It's been hanging around all that long. So I grabbed some of these and burnt them because that's what's done for Ash Wednesday. As a reminder that in the voice of celebration, sometimes people lose track and forget what they're actually singing their hosannas for. So I've burnt some leaves from 2018 and they're here today. And for those who might want to, even though it's not Ash Wednesday, but the sense of, actually, I'm making a journey. I've listened to the, the impassioned reading from Gemma today, uh, capturing Luke really well. And I'm wanting to make this journey. If, if you have communion, and then I'll just be over on the side. I'll just put a small mark of this, a little smudge on your forehead as a reminder that, you know, from, from dust we came and from dust we return. But that's not a hopeless story. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, remembering Jesus who was crucified, died, buried, resurrected, glorified. The mark of this just reminds us we're on a big journey, we're on a large road, and it doesn't end in despair and brokenness. It actually ends in life. It ends in wholeness. Something about understanding our mortality that's really important and the spirit that gives us life. So if you'd like to be smudged with a little cross of the ashes from Palm Sunday of 2018, feel free um, to, to do that. I'll just be off on one side. Gemma, would you like to come and lead us in communion? Thank you. So as we prepare for communion and these um, symbolic acts that John has set out for us, I'd like to remind us that... Um, Paul's letter to Corinth, his first letter, he states that no testing or no temptation has occurred to us that isn't common for everyone. We're, we're, it, it, this isn't a message for a, an individual. It's a message for all of us and we stand together under the same predicament. And there's a beauty in that because we're also called together as a church, as the body of Christ. And as, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key themes of the Gospel of Luke is table fellowship, is sitting down together, eating together. What happens when you have a meal with a bunch of mates? You hear their world. And you share yours. That's a precious thing and it's so important that Jesus repeats it again and again, and the gospel writers write it down. They tell it to the early church. They want people to remember to share life together. It is a kingdom principle, this sharing of life, sharing of self. So if, if when you take the cup, remember that that is what we're called for and to bring the essence of Christ, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, remember me in the last meal. Remember me. Bring that to your community, to your listening, to your sharing. And as we do so, remember the beautiful thing, the gifts of the people around you. Their hurts that you can hold and pray for and treasure and reach out in caring ways. 
and also to invite the caring ways of others into your life. So come forward, grab your cup, get your dollop of ash <laughs> and, um, and get hold of a pen and when everyone's seated I'll pray. Come forward.